Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. That is the promo for next week's sermon series that begins, and I was so excited to tell you about it. I don't know if you noticed, but I came up at the wrong time. Anybody notice that? I started walking up at the wrong time, and I saw the video starting to play, and I, I, I was like right here, and I thought, I'm going to play it off like I, I planned this. I just kept walking over this way and like look at the screen like that's, that was the plan the whole time. I just want to direct your attention. Then as I watched the video, I thought maybe I'll just pretend like that it was being cool. I thought, no, then, then you're lying. So here I am. I'm confessing my sins. I don't even need a booth or a priest or nothing. How about that? Amen. I'm glad you're here today. Today is a special Sunday, but I am excited about next week. Next week is our six events that will change the world, the brand new sermon series. I'll be preaching all six of these sermons starting next Sunday. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Bible having answers. A lot of people look around the world today and they think, what a mess. What is going on? I mean, it's insanity that we see around us. What is happening? What's amazing to me is that the Bible has answers to all of these things. It, it predicts what we call prophesize so much of what we see. And not just what we've seen and not just what we see, but it prophesies what we will see. It talks about six events that are yet to come, beginning with the rapture. We're going to talk about that from a biblical perspective starting next Sunday and for the next six weeks after that. I hope that you'll be here. In fact, there's a little card. I think it was in the seats. Uh, go ahead and grab that. I want you to look at it right now. That's the little card right there. Is that in your seat there? All right. Oh, it's inside the church program. All right, very good. So if you didn't get a church program, you are a bad church member. Or either that, we have bad ushers. How about that? Let's blame it on them. Yeah, oh, you got it. Okay, go ahead and look at it. So right there is the uh, events, six events that will change the world. And that's what we're going to be starting next week. On the back side, and by the way, it's a fascinating sermon series. You'll definitely want to be here for all six, um, especially the very first one. But let me point you to the back. The back, because next Sunday is a big day for us. Uh, we have four of these a year. We have a special event uh, in correspondence with the new sermon series and called the big, uh, called, uh, the big Game Giveaway, the Win the Ultimate Super Bowl Experience. This is something our team came up with, and, uh, and I was fascinated by this idea. The idea is this. Everyone that comes next week will be given a card, not this card, and it's going to be placed inside of a, um, uh, a what is this? Don't act like you don't know. You're from Vegas. <laughs> oh, you all know. You all know. I, I don't. I'm from Vegas, too. Anyway, uh, it goes like this, and they pull a card out, and whoever wins, this is what they're going to win, the ultimate Super Bowl giveaway package thing. You say, tickets to the Super Bowl? No, because we we, we're a poor church. You understand? <laughs> but they are going to win a uh, big screen TV and, uh, and uh, uh, food platters, uh, food platters. With all sorts of good food, like bread. <laughs> I'm on a cleanse right now, Ben. Our church knows. I told him I'm on a cleanse. I'm not allowed to eat bread or dairy or grains or, or food. <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, so we're going to, you say, what, what is the purpose of, of, of the giveaway? Well, it's to encourage everybody to be here for that day. And also so that you can maybe on that Super Bowl Sunday come to church in the morning and then invite your pastor and his family over for the party. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, right. Um, anyway, that is going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be a winner in both services, and that's going to be a lot of fun. How many of you think it's okay to have fun when you come to church? Man, I know, people come to church and they're just like nervous or maybe they're scared or maybe they're angry or I don't know. People just come to church and not happy, but I'm glad to come to church and be happy. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. I'm happy about today too. Now look, because specifically that is our big day, next week it's our big day, it gives you a hook to invite a friend. Hey, come to church. We've got this new sermon series. It's about the end of the world. My pastor's really awesome as well as they're doing the Super Bowl giveaway thing and, and come. And if you come, every person that comes gets entered into the raffle. It's going to be awesome. And, so, and, and how many of you right now are already thinking of somebody in your mind that doesn't know Jesus, and maybe if they heard the truth that Jesus is coming back, maybe by God's grace, maybe they'll get saved? How many of you know somebody in your life that's not yet a believer? How many of you? Come on, say, let, let me hear it. Say amen. You know somebody? Just last Sunday, there was a man who's been coming to our church. 
after the second service, had the opportunity in that back room to walk him through the gospel, tell him how he could be born again, and he was saved. Can I get an amen? amen? See, there are more people out there that you know need to get saved. And so bring them. Now, you're already visualizing them. You need to invite them, and you need to pray for them. I want to point you to that VIP card right there. Right there on, so on that card. Don't put it down. Already. Some of you already have it. All right. You see that little VIP card? Pull it out. Pull it out. Pull it out. Look at it. Everybody's looking at me. Look at it. Look at the thing. Look at it. We're taking his time. Hurry. Come on. This is what I want you to do. All right. If you didn't get one coming in, you get one on the way out. I'm serious. I want all of us to do this together. It only works if we all do it together. Am I on page? Right? On page? Okay. All right. This is what you do. I want you to VIP these people. I want you to visualize who they are right now. Who is it that God is talking to you about that needs to come and hear about Jesus? Visualize them right now. They work with you. They live beside you. They go to school with you. They're your relative, your friend. Think about them. I'm not putting them in your mind. The Lord is. Who is that person? VIP, visualize, invite. Okay, take this card and give it to them. You say, but I'm nervous. Then slip it under the door <laughs> with a little note. Visualize, invite, and then pray. Look, nothing we do in and of our own power will do anything. It's all what God does, not us. Pray. Oh, God, please bring them. Oh, God, please bring them. Oh, God, would you bring them? God, would, the, would you bring them? Please help us to bring them. And then you bring them next Sunday. Visualize, invite, pray. Grab that card. If you already have the card out, I think it's appropriate right now. Go ahead and put that name in there right now. Put in that name in there. Hold that in your purse or your pocket or your wallet. Hold that all week long and keep a hold of this and then visualize, invite, and pray. Uh, get that card if you don't have it. All right. Today. Today we have the opportunity of hearing from apologist Ben Shetler. He came last year, and when he came on a Sunday called Clear Answers Sunday, I made the decision that he would come back on an annual basis. Ben Shetler refers to himself and others refer to him as a Bible communicator because the term apologist may be a little outdated. It means someone who takes the Bible and communicates to the current culture about issues that the culture is very, very, maybe um, confused about. This man has been an incredible influence on my life and teaching me, and I know that he taught us tremendously last year. I'm taking his time, and so I'm going to quickly turn it over to him. All I would say is this. If you have friends, family, coworkers, neighbors that have questions that cannot be answered, and you feel like you don't know how to answer them, if you yourself have questions in the faith, and sometimes you think, I know what I believe, but I kind of don't know what I believe, this is the perfect Sunday to come. Because today, we're going to give clear answers. Why don't you welcome with me today, apologist Ben Shetler. I am so excited to be here, and uh, I'll tell you, this is brand new, and I'm talking about moral relativism today, uh, so you can pull out your pillows and go to sleep, uh, but no, I seriously am talking about moral relativism, and I seriously am incredibly excited uh, to share. Uh, one reason I'm excited is because I'm at Southern Hills Baptist Church. Uh, th this is the greatest church on this location in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. It really is, and, uh, and I love it. It's, uh, I really do love being here. Pastor Josh is a good friend of mine, and, and thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to next year already. I don't even know what I'm preaching on, and uh, so I'm really pumped. But there's so many other great pastors that you have here. Pastor Jason, uh, Pastor Fred, uh, Pastor Chris Owens is a new guy, and uh, I've known him for years, and I told his wife today, uh, I preached at their church out in California when they were there. Then they moved to Florida, and I preached there, and now I found them here. And I said, you're just going to have to move again because I keep finding you. And uh, so I've known them for a while. I hope you get to know them if you haven't yet, Pastor Pastor Blake, uh, let's see, uh, Hakeem Smith, uh, Michael, who does it. Anyways, we could keep going on and on. I, I, I love the staff here. I hope you do too. And I love talking to you guys because this is a church that has some energy. <laughs> Amen? All right. So uh, John 14, that's where we're going to look today. Uh, I, I tried to make my uh, title a little more interesting than moral relativism. And uh, I'm calling it the ultimate discovery. 
the ultimate discovery, a Q&A on moral relativism. Now, you may not know what that term, how many here are comfortable with that term when I say that you know what I mean? Okay, how many of you are going like, eh, I don't know, and I don't think I care, all right? Here's the reality, even if you don't know what the term means, if you're above the age of five in this room, you have encountered this ideology. It is woven into the fabric of our culture, of even some of our churches, families, and our lives. And so it's very important. I'm going to talk about the ultimate discovery. Now, to do that, we're in John 14. One of the more famous things that Jesus did, the Last Supper, made popular by the artist Leonardo da Vinci. Ooh, the Last Supper, oh, that's so cool. Here's Jesus and all these guys, and they're only sitting on one side of the table. (laughs) The very popular, the Last Supper, but what's interesting is the Last Supper depicts the most controversial statement Jesus made in his ministry. Why is this so popular? And what's interesting is the controversial statement that we're about to read in John 14 was actually intended to be a statement of comfort. The Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to be leaving, and they're like, wait a second. We followed you. You've ministered to us. You can't go. And in the midst of that, he makes this very comforting statement that our culture calls controversial. John 14, let's take a look. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. You know. Thomas saith unto him, Excuse me? What do you mean? You know where we're going. You you say you're about to leave. We don't know where you're going. Say what? Okay, he didn't say, that's all in the Greek. Thomas saith unto him, We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? We don't know where you're going, and how can we know? Verse 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's what Jesus said. He goes, I'm going to make it simple for you. I mean, like me, like things simple. He says, I'm going to make it simple for you. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We just sang a song a moment ago, I look to you. Who's the you? Jesus. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. But our culture says, it's fine if you believe in Jesus. It's fine if you believe a good te- that he's a good teacher, but you cannot believe that he is the way. You cannot believe that he is the only life. And you cannot believe that he is the truth. I'm fine if you believe Jesus is a truth, and that belief is moral relativism. And today, we need to understand how comforting the truth of God's word is. It's not controversial, it's comforting, and we're going to look at that today. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would direct our hearts and our minds to the pages of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that we would be challenged to not be moral relativists, but God, that we would be challenged to live the truth of your word, to stand on that truth, to love that truth, and to engage our world with that truth. God, would you help us to learn today? I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you, uh, like me, enjoy flying about as much as getting a finger in the eye, all right? How many like that, all right? Uh, Some of you go, I love getting on a plane until you actually get in that round metal tube and get up to 40,000 feet. It's uncomfortable. And I could go through, I did about 100,000 miles of flying last year, and I could go through the things that I don't like. But do you know who I feel really bad for on a plane? Little kids. Little kids were not made to be in a metal tube up in the sky at 40,000 feet. They were made to run free and to have fun. And, to, and then you put them in a plane and they're like, oh, 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 oh. you know who I feel even worse for? 
The parents. No, the babies. Those little things. I was on a 17-hour flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg, South Africa. That is not the amount of time you want to spend on a plane. Two babies. They were passing the baton between each other. The first would just scream his heart out or her heart out, and then he got done and passed it to the other one. And uh, I just felt so fit. I felt bad for the mom who's trying to, and I felt bad for the baby. I just felt bad. I'm like, I'm uncomfortable, but this poor baby. There is one exception to this rule. I do not feel bad for babies or for kids on any flight to MCO. You say, what is MCO? Orlando International <laughs> Airport. You know what? Those kids may get on a little cranky, but I am excited for them because what they're about to see is going to be awesome. <laughs> Disneyland. World. World, yes. I should know. I'm a Floridian. Don't show that slide yet. Um, <laughs> I'm getting off a plane in MCO right behind a girl four or five years old. She's got her little suitcase. It had some type of princess on it. And she's, I guarantee you, there's nothing in it. But she's got, she, you know, she's just pulling it. Girl is excited about going to Disney World. It's little. And I'm loving every minute of this. I'm just walking, I'm like, this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. This little girl, you know, she's getting, she's so excited walks down the jet bridge very slowly and walks into the Orlando International Airport, looks over at a kiosk, her face lights up like the sun and she lets go of her mom's hand and she's just running to this little kiosk that has Mickey Mouse and everything and she goes, Disney World! <laughs> now I'm not a creeper, but I walked as slow as I could because I wanted to see how this thing played out. Mom runs over to her, and she lets her look at the things for a little while. And then she grabs her, and she goes, this is not Disney? What do you mean? I thought we were flying to Disney World. And you can see the broken-hearted look on his face, and I'm just walking very slowly. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is great. And so the mom's like, no, no, we're going to Disney World. We're not there yet, but I thought the place, you know, you can see all this looking, but, you know, we're not there yet, but this, you know, you can enjoy these things. But there's something much greater coming. How many know there's something much greater than this life that's coming in the next? How many know? Amen. Now, what if, I, I just walked by and I thought, oh, I, I'd pay $20 just to see that girl's face when she walks into the Magic Kingdom. That, show, that, show that next picture. I, I imagine it's something like this. I said, look. Yeah, see, that's the best right there. That is the ultimate joy right there, touching Minnie and Mickey's nose right there. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know if that was a girl, but I met. Okay. Now, what if that mother, let's change this scenario a little bit. What if that mother would have gone up to that little girl and uh, she thought, you know, she thinks this is Disney World. That is her truth. Who am I to judge her? Who am I to break apart her world? She believes this is Disney, and maybe this little kiosk in the airport is Disney to her. I don't want to be one of those condescending parents, so we'll just camp out here in the airport and I'll never take my child to Disney and just affirm her belief that this is Disney World. You say, what would happen to that child? She'll grow up to be an adult one day and either one, think Disney is a kiosk in the airport, <laughs> or two, grow up to find out that her mother is terribly cheap and awful <laughs> because she told her a kiosk was the same as Disney World. Can I tell you, that is the problem of moral relativism. In our culture, we have affirmed things that are not true so as not to hurt people's feelings. And can I tell you, we miss out on the ultimate world and reality that God designed for us. This is confusing, but if you're a man or woman here today that thinks 
that you were born a man or woman, but are the opposite sex, I'm telling you, God has something greater for you. And that is how he made you. Uh, We could go on at a list of things, but God has not created us to believe that we are something we aren't, and everyone is not correct. There are some people that are wrong. There are some people that are right. And if we buy into the idea of moral relativism, we miss out on the ultimate discovery of who God wants us to be and the world in which he made. That's why he says it's simple now. Let's jump through here. I got these little slides here. Uh, We looked at this verse already, and we looked at the little girl. But I want to do a QA and a today as we discuss this. So we're talking about moral relativism. Well, then what, what is moral relativism? Let me give you a little definition. It's the belief that opposing moral claims can be correct simultaneously. In other words, notice that the mom, mom in this scenario would say, that is her truth. And yet the truth of the universe is that Disney is a little ways down the road. We say this all the time in our culture. Well, that's their truth. There's no such thing. Two things can't be right simultaneously. Uh, Here it is, the belief that there is no fixed right or wrong. Now, instead of digging into this, how many like me like to show instead of tell? How many are more of the show instead of tell? I am going to show you moral relativism, and when I do, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Here, take a look at this video. How do you define right and wrong? Right and wrong, I guess, are just dependent on... so loaded it's to me it just varies because it's all cultural at the end of the day what right and wrong is in certain cultures and certain views so i don't believe there is a right or wrong sometimes i'm not sure i don't have a way to define it there's so many people define it in so many other ways so it's just like i guess it's just subjective i have no i have no definition for it right now do you have any money on you right now? Yeah. If I stole that money from you, would you consider that to be wrong? I mean, for sure, sure, I'd clock you, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it also, it also depends. It That's just depends. But in, I feel like it's just like... There's a term for it that I learned. It's just like you never know what position someone was in, why they would have taken that... If you had taken that money from me, so then... In my eyes, it could have been wrong, but then in your eyes, it could have been right because you needed it the most. It was just sitting down in my bag. I'm not using it, but then you could probably need it. Yeah, but at the same time, (laughs) it's wrong though because he's he's stealing it. Yeah, yeah, but this is what I'm saying though. Fundamental attribution error. You can't just assume that they're being wrong for taking it. They probably like absolutely needed it to live. So in the time for them, it could have just been right that he needed to take the money. So you're saying to me how, that, how do you have something to say so, now, my guy? Because he actually gave me an example, so now I have something to, to respond to. Okay. So you're saying to me, if she was to go to a random person and just, you know, take something out the back, or if anybody was just to do that, you're gonna automatically say, you know, huh, they're probably hungry or they really need it, so it's okay, so it's not wrong. To I'm not do. saying it's okay. I'm just saying there's a reasoning to it why they would think it's right and why I would think it's wrong. So it's all just relative. And varies by situation what's right and what's wrong. Well, that being said, in your situation, well, from from your eyes, that might you know that might work out. But let's say authority, that's not gonna that's not gonna work out. Yeah, in but the that's same just way. based on your idea of authority and American authority. How many of you have seen that before? Not that, but something like it. Yeah, that's it. That's what I mean by more of It's just. Well, how can, how, how can you say that it might be right to her? What's right? And here's what she ultimately said. She goes, I don't know if I can define right and wrong. See, this is where our world is in its utter confusion. But you know what's beautiful about God is he makes it simple. He gave us a book. And this book tells us what is right and what is wrong. I, I just, there's so many places I want to go from here, but that is moral relativism. Um, I, uh, 
I t- well, I'm going to come back to him, but I'll just, just real fast here. I talked with my Uber driver today, and I asked him, I said, can you help me with my message today? See, this is, you fly me all the way to Pensacola, and I get my message from the Uber driver. Uh, <laughs> but I said, can you help me with my message? He goes, yeah. I go, how do you define right and wrong? And so he gave me some interesting answers, and then he said, well, how do you define it? This was my answer. I said, I can't. I said, I'm broken and I'm fallen. I don't know what right and wrong is. I only have my own personal desires. But here's how I define it. I go to the book that God wrote called the Bible and I find out what he says about it. And I do it two ways. One, if the Bible talks about it directly, then I can know very simply. And two, if it's an issue the Bible doesn't talk about, I try to find a principle in the Bible to apply it. The Bible is our source of truth. But our culture says, no, no, you make your own truth and you see how the problem comes because what did the young man say? What about was a word that started with an A? What about? See, we've got to pick a way. Someone's got, if I steal from you, someone's got to be right and someone's got to be wrong. Otherwise, we have chaos. So how do we handle this issue? How do we handle the issue of moral relativism? Um, I want to get into this, but well, I don't think we have time. So be aware of partial moral relativism. You say, what, what is that? I'll tell you next time I come. All right, here we go. Uh, what do I say to the moral relativist? So what do I say to this person? Because here she goes, there is no right and wrong. What do I say to them? Now, I come out for clear answer Sundays, and it's my job as an apologist, a cultural missionary, uh, whatever you want to call me, uh, it's my job to find answers for these. And I'll tell you, it takes a lot of work. Uh, you got to spend a lot of work working on, on how do I have answers for the Bible being reliable? How do I have answers for the existence of God? I love my work, but, but it takes work. This takes almost no work at all. This is the easiest one. How do I give an answer? You ready? We're going to give you a clear answer today. How do I say or how do I answer or what do I say to the moral relativist? And here's what it is. It's very simple. Moral relativism is a, de- a self-defeating claim. So what do I say the moral? Well, moral relativism. Here's moral relativism. Absolutely, there is no right and wrong. That's the claim. Now understand the claim that there is no right and wrong is a moral claim. It's an assessment. So there is no right and wrong. That's a moral claim. So then I ask the person that says there is no right and wrong, is that a moral claim? Yes, it is. Then my next question is, if there is no right and wrong, is that statement right? <laughs> That's it. You drop the mic and walk off. Okay. <laughs> tonight we're going to talk about properly engaging so you don't embarrass somebody, but I say, is that statement right? And they might say this, well, yes, it is right. But it's the only statement that's right. Okay, fair enough. I've got another question for you. Is the statement, the only statement that is right, is that moral absol- there is no moral absolute or there is no right and wrong, is that statement correct? Yes. And you're saying that statement is correct, And also the statement, there is no right and wrong, is correct. So now we have a problem because you said only one was correct, but this statement is now correct. So now we have two things that are correct. Do you believe both are correct? Yes. So now we have three things that are correct. Both of these are correct, and the statement that both of these are correct are correct. Do you believe that to be true? Yes. Do you see where I'm going here? That we live in an absolute world... It is absurd to say that there is no right and wrong because that is a right and wrong statement. It's self-defeating. Now, how many, like me, you don't have to raise your hand to this, but know a lot of intelligent people that believe in a self-defeating statement? I mean, intelligent college professors, I mean, people that I know that are really smart believe this, so why in the world would they if even a child could figure this out? I mean, it took us two seconds to discuss this. Why does the moral relativist believe it? And that's what we need to talk about. Why is that? So let me click to our next slide here. Why does the moral, why would anyone be a moral relativist or believe this? And here's the answer. Are you ready? 
It has nothing to do with logic. The statement is logical at its face. There is no right and wrong. Is that statement right? Why would someone believe this? Here's why. Oh, there we go. That's why. Her feelings. Sorrow and pain. Now, this is so important. Is it good or bad for your child to be sad? Let me ask this again. You had to think in church today. I'm sorry for that. Come back next week. We'll think about the end of the world. It won't be so pressing. <laughs> you gotta come. Now, don't come to church and not think. Don't turn your brain off. You gotta think. Answer this question Is it good or bad for your child to be sad? Yes. Is it good or bad? You can go back and watch last year's uh, uh, clear answers where I talked about this. The first statement you need to do is ask, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what do you mean by sad? Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to give you something that people in the church do not believe, yet the Bible teaches it, and this is so important. We believe that being sad is a bad thing. We say, have a good day. And what do we mean by that? Well, I hope nothing happens where you will be sad at the end of the day. And yet the Bible teaches that sometimes being sad is a good thing. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 7, verse 10, the Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Do you know that sorrow brings salvation and worldly sorrow brings death? Now, I'm going to give you an illustration of this. What do I mean? Is it good for your child to be sad? Sometimes, yes, and I'm going to explain why. So uh, anybody been on uh, Facebook or any social media and seen the most recent video of the guy shoveling snow? (laughs) This is gold. You've got to Google guys shoveling snow. Now, he is doing a dance, kind of like I would. He's out there trying to shovel snow, and he goes up, and then all of a sudden, his feet start sliding. And this is hilarious. He's like, whoa, 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 and he's going all over the place shoveling snow. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. Well, I was watching that video the other day for like the 40th time. It's like 10 seconds long. It's so great. And then I scrolled to the next video, and the next video was this guy at a party, and he was clearly inebriated. And he is you know, kind of did, and he gets this woman, I don't know if it's wife or whoever, and he's trying to get her to dance, and he won't, so instead of getting her to dance with him, he picks her up by the legs. (laughs) So he walks over and grabs her. Now, I think he was trying to hoist her a little more, but in his inebriated state, he hoisted too much. (laughs) It's hilarious, except for not for the woman. And he flips that woman over his back, and she lands like, boom. So he's like, whoosh, whoo, and throws her over, and she flips all the way over, and bam, lands on the, on the ground. It, if you see it, it makes you laugh so hard. <laughs> How many feel really bad for the woman? How many of you feel far worse for the man? I mean, he's going to get it the next, I mean, this guy's an idiot. Now, Is it good to be sad? Well, the next day when that man sobers up and pays $10,000 for the woman's chiropractic bill, (laughs) hopefully he is sad about his drunkenness and his drunken behavior. Right? Because if he's not, the next part he's at, he's going to do the same thing. See, godly sorrow works to repentance. We as a culture feel like being sad is bad. 
No, no. When you do something wrong, when you make a mistake, you need to be corrected so that you can get it right. Godly sorrow works to repentance. And it is ridiculous to leave a little girl at a kiosk because you don't want to make her sad when something far greater awaits just down the road. The same is true with your children. You need to tell them what is right and wrong even if it makes them sad because they'll be glad you did. But moral relativism attempts to remove the negative emotions. And when we remove the negative emotions, we're happy. But we keep being sad because we keep repeating the same negative behavior. Can I give you one example in our culture? This breaks my heart. It honestly does. Do you know that almost, it's like 48, almost 50% of people that have gender reassignment surgery commit suicide. Why? Because nobody told them that if you're a man, you should be a man. And that God created you in a certain way. Now, some people say it in such a mean way that it's not helpful. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. You say in such a mean way that it's like, well, you're just, I can't even have a relationship with you. And I hope you come back tonight to talk about how we can engage those that we disagree with. But the reality is, is we must tell people what is right and wrong to save their souls. The Bible says godly sorrow works to repentance. It's okay if your children are sad sometimes. You know, it's okay if you're sad sometimes. Sometimes it needs to be sorrow to go, you know what? I need to make some changes in my life because I'm not on the right path. Godly sorrow works to repentance. Let's keep going on. Um, uh, here's, here's a statement. You take a picture of this. This might be worth repeating. Uh, being wrong has negative emotional side effects. By ensuring that culture reinforces wrong or bad behavior, the moral relativist attempts to eliminate the guilt that comes from being wrong. And that's exactly what's happening there. Well, I got three minutes left. Where is moral relativism? The answer is everywhere. Our culture, our churches, our family, and our lives. Now, here's why I wanted to talk about partial moral relativism. Here's where moral relativism begins to emerge in the church culture, in our life culture, and here. We're not absolute. No one in this room is an absolute moral relativist, but we're partial. And what we believe, this is our new truth in the church, is that this person has an idea of moral claim, this person has the opposing moral claim, and standing halfway in between those two claims is correct. We call the term balance, and we think it's good, and you'll not find it in the pages of Scripture. You'll not find God calling anyone to be a balanced church or a balanced family or a balanced individual, yet we use this all the time. Let me give you an example. Is murder wrong, yes or no? What about the guy that wants to murder his boss? Is it okay to murder your boss? No, No. okay, you believe that, but the guy who does murder his boss believes it's okay to murder his boss. So we have two competing moral claims. The guy that says murder is okay, the guy that says it's wrong. What is halfway between? Beating up your boss. (laughs) So you leave here today in church and say, I'm a balanced individual, I don't murder my boss, but I'm gonna beat him up. Okay, now do neither of those because we as Christians believe in absolute morality. But we've made this mistake that we say, well, well, we've got to be balanced. And so we go over here and look at this idea and this idea. And I discovered this in churches. It's really unfortunate. I've talked with a pastor. He says, we've got a really balanced church. And then I go to the next church and and this guy hates what this guy does because he thinks he's like a raging liberal. And this guy's like, we strike the right balance. That guy's crazy. But that other pastor said he was balanced. I'm confused. See, here's the reality is we all want to be balanced, but we're just like the book of Judges. You know what they did in the book of Judges? Everyone did that which was right. Now, how many want your children to do that which is right? Yeah. How many want to do that which is right? You say, so isn't this good in the book of Judges? I want to do that which is right. Hang on, the next prepositional phrase is a problem. In their own eyes. That's balance right there. Everyone doing that which is right in their own eyes. God give us some young people, God give us some church members that go, I don't want to be balanced, I want to be biblical. I want to be Bible. 
I want to take this book. Now, here's the key. You say, well, wait a second, Ben, because different people do different things differently. So how do we know what is right? The key is, write this word down, contextualization. Contextualization. You say, what do you mean by that? It is taking Bible principles and applying them to your situation. Do you know that you should not punish every child that does something in the same way? There's some children that need extra punishment because they're optimists. They think everything they do is right, so they need a little extra punishment. Other children are very, very hard on themselves. And what they need is a parent to come and go, well, that's balanced parenting. Well, that's what you mean by that, but really it's contextualized parenting. You're taking the truth of Scripture and applying it to this child's life. Well, the same is true in our lives. We need to look at the situation and apply it biblically. Do you see the difference? We don't stand halfway between two wrong ideas. We go directly to the Bible and go, what is the Bible principle for this? And tonight we're going to talk about that just a little more. Um, uh, how do we know what right and wrong is? Uh, God clearly shows us from the Bible. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I was looking for a, um, I'm sorry, I'm taking you up on the 1040 thing. Uh, I uh, was looking for a good illustration today of this, and I had a whole bunch, and I just could not settle on one until I talked to my Uber driver on the way here today. We think that telling people this way is right and this way is wrong is a bad thing. Our culture has conditioned us to do this. It is a wonderful thing. Let me show you why. Let's say Pastor Tice, uh, Pastor Josh, and Pastor Jason and I go to the airport. And uh, we're going to fly. We'll go to Disney World. Why not? We're going to fly to Disney World. We're going to MCO. So LAS to MCO. And uh, they give us all our tickets, and uh, we get to the gate, and they give us our tickets, and I say, what, what gate, or we get to the, the kiosk there, and they say, what, what gate are you going to? And uh, I ask that, and because uh, it's not printed on our boarding passes. And they say, just pick a gate. I say, well, wait a second, what do you mean just pick a gate? Are all the planes going to Orlando to gate? Oh, no, they're going to Chicago and L.A. and all these other places, but you just pick one. We don't want to offend you by telling you which one you have to pick. So we go through security, we walk in, and I'm walking around, and I'm like, well, I fly a lot. I think I'm going to go to A12 over here. Pastor Tice looks over at me, and he's like, bad choice, man. I mean, this is why, you know, th this is why I only bring you in once a year. You don't know how to make good choices. <laughs> he goes, I fly to Vegas all the time. I'm going to gate A8, and you should come with me. And so now we're disagreeing, and Pastor Jason goes, well, you know what, Ben flies a lot, but Pastor Tice flies a lot out of here, so he knows where, so he's trying to decide who to go with, and so he's like, I'll go with him. And then we get in this big discussion with all kinds of people who are like, well, my kids fly to Orlando a lot, and they go out of gate A9, A and, and we have this big discussion in the airport, and we're all confused, and we all go to different gates, and none of us get to Orlando. You know how that could be avoided? By telling us which gate to go through. Our world doesn't know which gate to go through, and it is heartbreaking. They don't know where to go. I let that Uber driver talk the whole way here. He's talking about this and, and that and other things. We cross the bridge over here, and he goes, you know, i got to be honest. I'm at a tough place in my life, and people are, aren't they? This world is broken, it's tough. He goes, I'm at a tough place in my life. He goes, I don't know. This is what he said. I don't know which way to go. And I thought I'd do. I know exactly which way to go because I have the pages of Scripture and the light of the gospel in my heart and because I know Jesus and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the reason why my heart breaks is there are thousands, yea, tens of thousands of people in Las Vegas, Nevada that don't know which way to go but I'm encouraged because they have you. Did you hear that? They have you and you have him. And God give us a church that cares enough about people 
to not tell them that their truth is right, but to tell them in a loving way that their truth is wrong or their claim is wrong, but the Bible is right. God makes it simple for us. There's not a bunch of ways. There's one way. And all the comfort of that and all the challenge of that. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Who'd say, you know what, Ben? I care enough about moral truth that next week I'm going to VIP somebody. I'm going to envision them, I'm going to invite them, and I'm going to pray for them. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Who'd say, Ben, I care enough about moral truth that I'm willing to do that next week. Would you slip your hand up all across this room? Praise the Lord. Several hands. Anyone else who'd say, you know what, Ben, I care enough about absolute truth that I'm willing to invite someone to this church next week. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Who'd say, Ben, I care enough about moral truth to begin to submit my parenting my husbanding, my wifing, my my living in my marital relationship, my family, my life to the word of God, not my own opinion. And Ben, there's an area in my life where I've kind of been kind of doing my own thing. I've kind of been doing the balance. And Ben, I need to do the biblical instead of the balance. Would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up all across this room? Several hands, many, many hands. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You And put your hands down. Anyone else who'd say, you know what, Ben, I've been doing the balance and I need to do the Bible. Anyone else? Ben, that's me. All right. Thank you. Heads bowed and eyes closed. There are many hands here today. I'm just going to spend a word of prayer and then pass it over to Pastor Josh. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will work in our hearts and in our church today. And Lord, I don't know how we'll conclude, but I, I pray that today that those who said your word is absolute, God, may it govern our lives and our families, but God, also might it govern the way that we respond. And Lord, I pray that those that raise their hand said they're going to VIP someone. Lord, I pray that they do it, God, because your word is so important. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed, eyes closed, Pastor, would you come? If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world.